So this is uh, some joint work with uh, Nia Drei, Jürgen Joost and Hong Van Lee um, on these invariant geometric structures. Um, so actually there are basically two parts of this. The one uh, will be on uh, statistical models and these invariant structures, sufficient st uh, statistics and invariant um, uh, tensors. And this, uh, the second part will be on some uh, generalization of the notion of paradigmized measure models, and uh, the third part uh, is something about monotonicity, which is actually an application of the second part. Uh, so let me just start with, uh, basically, what, what is the notion of a parameter measure model? So what you want is you have a certain parameter, which is usually taken from a manifold M, and you have a fixed sample space omega, and you want somehow a notion of uh, measures, of finite measures, or uh, probability measures, pi of psi, which, um, which vary smoothly with, um, the, uh, with, with the psi. Uh, and uh, that's where basically you have uh, several ways of attempting to make this precise. As for example, by uh, Pistone and Zemti, there's a very nice uh, uh, structure to define what this differentiably means. Um, there are other attempts. For the beginning, I will take a very, uh, in some sense, very basic and very naive uh, assumption, which is, however, very useful. It uh, goes back to uh, Amari from the 1980s with some slight modification by us. Um, so you just take parameter price measure model, it's <coughs> you fix some background <coughs> measure, you're not, and then you give this by some density function. So psi is from your parameter space, omega is just the element of the measure space. Uh, you require this to be positive because uh, you want to take the logarithm of it and uh, you want that if you take the derivative into, so V is supposed to be a tangent space of the manifold, if you take this derivative you get an L1 regular function. Okay, so that's uh, general, you just require finite models because, um, and uh, it's statistical if this, I call this a norm, if this is one, so if these are, all of these are probability measures. Uh, then if this is not just in L1, but in Lk, so the k's power of this is also uh, finitely integrable, then uh, we call this k integrable. Okay. And, uh, well, so, uh, the, the uh, difference between statistical and uh, parameterized measure models is not really big. It's some, more, more or less a, a matter of convenience. So if you have a parameterized uh, measure model, <laughs> Then you can always normalize it and you get a statistical model and of course statistical models are just uh, special cases. So that's actually not a big deal, talking about one or the other, uh, it's just the same information. Okay, then uh, the next thing is the statistics. Well, of course, uh, all of you know this is uh, you have two se several measure spaces, omega and omega prime. You take a, a measurable map between them. And if you have such a parameterized <coughs> family, then you get another parameterized family on the uh, omega prime space where you just take the push forward of the measure. So the push forward of the measure in general is uh, um, uh, defined like this. Uh, the, the push forward of the measure of the set so A prime, which is a subset of this, is just the original measure of the inverse. Okay, that gives you a measure and uh, that's all known. Um, and then you call such a statistic sufficient for the model uh, if you can actually write this as uh, some density function which only depends on k of this. So that's going to be some function just on omega prime. And if you can uh, write this density function this way for some fixed measure mu, then you say that the statistic is, suffi uh, is sufficient for the model. And the heuristic meaning is uh, usually this map here is subjective, so omega prime some smaller space, smaller dimensional space. So you can reduce the number of variables uh, to of omega prime to get full information on uh, this model. Okay. Um, then this is a slightly sloppy definition, it's, uh, but uh, I thought in a 20 minute or 15 minute talk, <laughs> sorry. Uh, it's, it's too uh, complicated to write on the full definition. So basically that's, that's correct. An invariant tensor field is a tensor field on the manifold M such that for every statistic suffic uh, sufficient statistic, uh, this is a pullback. So in the, in the previous talk we had, uh, um, if these are manifolds and kappa is a diffeomorphism, that's also a special case of a statistic. So then it, it should be uh, the statistic of something. <coughs> so let me just give you some examples. Uh, the first one is tau 1. Um, I just write it like this. Uh, yeah, so, so that's what you consider. Then of course you can, because everything's nice and regular, you can pull this out. 
This here is p bar d mu, so that's just the same as that, and that's just the derivative of the measure. So uh, this tall one is uh, very simple. It's actually not there if your model is statistical. Yeah, if, if this here is equal to one, then this derivative is always zero, and uh, so it's only there if you actually have something which is non-productive. Then, of course, if you do the same thing for two entries, then you get uh, the Fisher metric, which is just defined by this formula. Then, uh, if you do this for three, you get this tensor, and uh, this turns out uh, that was invented by Mari, uh, generalizing the, uh, this uh, an idea of Chansoff. And this is actually related to the construction of these alpha connections and dual connections and so forth, so that's a very important tensor. But if you don't care about this, then you say, hey, why stop at three? Yeah, you can define this for any n variables. So you take uh, this tensor here and uh, define it like that. OK, here, you know, you have to be a little careful about uh, if this integral actually converges. So um, this here only converges if uh, you have k and regularity so that these logarithm functions all lie in LK for k at least. <laughs> Okay, so all of these are invariant, that's very easy to check, and actually um, the question is, are there any other tensors which are invariant under statistic, uh, statistics? And uh, this was actually given by Chensov and Campbell uh, for finite measure space. Um, so the only in two invariant measures is, um, measure space is of this form. So we have this tau 2, that's a Fisher metric. And then you have here some combination of these d1, d2. These are written out this. And these functions depend uh, only on pi upside. Now, if you have a statistical model, then this here is 0. So this term vanishes. And then uh, f is, of course, a constant, because it only depends on this. So it's up to a constant, the Fisher metric. So that's a well-known result. Uh, for 3, it's the same thing, except uh, in the non-metric uh, case, you already see something happening here. Um, there was supposed to colors here, but okay, uh, never mind. Okay, so if you have a three tensor, then you get this uh, Amari uh, three tensor, and then you get some other combinations. Basically, they're just some al algebraic things. So you can take this here and uh, tensor it with tau one, yeah, and then you can take permutations of this, or you can take three tau ones, yeah, and all these coefficients are supposed to be um, functions, and that are that are the only ones. And of course, for statistical model, uh, all the tau ones will be zero. So everything that's here is crossed out, and you just get the Amari uh, chance of tensor uh, as the only invariant tensor. Uh, so it's not so easy anymore if n gets bigger. Uh, for example, uh, OK, you, we have one tensor that was this tensor top 4. But there are other ones. Yeah, And uh, for example, this one here. You can take the Fisher metric applied to two tensors, and you can take any information, or you can take uh, any uh, combination of these four uh, indices. You can take something like this, you can take something like this, you can take linear combinations uh, with this, and it's clear. I mean, all of these will be invariant because they're just uh, tensor products of these invariant tensors. And uh, we actually call such tensors to be algebraically generated by the terms. Yeah, any linear combination and tensor products, that will be <coughs> generate, uh, generated by that. And then what Campbell and Chensov tell you, uh, in them, in for n equal uh, 2 or 3, these are the only invariant tensors. And actually, we can uh, do this without any assumption. So you can take any me measure space without any uh, uh, restriction. It doesn't need to be topological space, manifold, or anything. Uh, but on this, uh, any invariant tensor is one of these. So basically, it's the tau n plus their tensor product. Uh, and here, yeah, here we have what we just heard. Yeah, if you have smooth densities, then uh, we just uh, heard that then any tensor feed also has to be the Fisher metric. Actually, if you look at the idea of the proof, uh, then you can generalize this to arbitrary tensor, uh, tensors, and, and you can show actually this, uh, the analogous statement also. Okay, so that's that's the first part. I don't have the time to uh, to go into the details of how how we do this. Um, what I want to point out is now some generalization of the notion of parametrized measure model. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as I said before, that's sort of the naive approach that we're taking. Every measure is given by some density, which is positive, with respect to some fixed background uh, uh, measure. Mm -hmm. uh, some problems that you might have with this is, uh, first of all, uh, this is supposed to be um, differentiable, right? But for a given psi, actually you can change this function. Yeah, I mean, it's only uh, defined up to null sets. Yeah? 
And how, well, if, if you change it at the null set, then there it won't be differentiable anymore. Uh, okay, you can say what is a null set, but okay, if you have an infinite, tra uh, uncountable family, then this uncountable union of null sets might not be a null set anymore. So, so there's some question, uh, what, what does it mean that you can always find some function so that it's differentiable? Okay, that's uh, one technical issue. The other one is uh, this positivity of P0. Yeah, it means that all the measures psi xi have exactly the same null sets, yeah, because they all have the same null sets as the fixed background measure u naught has. And that is a restriction which actually sometimes is in the way, uh, more than the first one probably. Uh, um, and so we propose the following definition. Uh, you observe that the space S of omega, that's the space of sine finite, me uh, finite measures that should be here, is a Banach space. Yeah? You can add finite <coughs> measures, and there's a, a norm called the total variation, and that makes it into a Banach space. Okay, and P of omega is a set of probability measures, M of F omega is a set of finite measures, so you have this inclusion. And then what you do is actually something which is extremely naive. Uh, actually, the amazing thing is that it works. You get something useful out of it. You take a measure space, and a prioritized measure model, or statistical model, is a map which goes from your manifold into the space of measures, or probability measure, which is differentiable if regarded as this map between two Banach spaces. That means if you take the total, I mean, just as you learn it in multivariate calculus, you get a uh, differential operator, which is a Jacobi matrix, essentially, and, uh, and, and you have your definition. Yeah? So, so, your, so your differential is just a linear map from P psi of m to S omega. Okay, uh, it's a nice definition, but the question is, of course, is it useful? Um, but uh, first of all, <laughs> before I ask this question, let, let me uh, tell you what the advantages are. There's no need for a background measure in this definition, so in particular, the null sets can completely change. Uh, it really is more than what you have uh, before. So here's some strange example uh, uh, on, on the interval from zero to pi. So you have here basically some density function and uh, if you take this, this would be the, the, uh, the, the function p bar. Yeah? Uh, if you take this as p bar, it's not differentiable at psi equals zero, as you can easily see. Nevertheless, it's differentiable in this sense, because if you take the differential quotient, pi x minus pi zero, this disappears, divided by psi, uh, then you just have this term here. And you need to show that the integral of this term goes to zero, which you can do because you can forget about one of psi, you're integrating over zero pi, that's periodic, and then it goes to zero. Yeah, so it's, it's not a pointwise convergence, therefore you cannot differentiate this function, but it's a, a differentiability on the average, so you don't need uh, as much regularity. So that's one of the advantages. Um, but then if you define these tensors, you still need the logarithm of the density function. Yeah, if you don't have that, then uh, what good is this? Yeah, but then the important observation is actually the following. If you have such a measure model, and uh, then the, the, the uh, derivative at, uh, of any vector is actually dominated by the measure where you take the derivative on. So that's a key observation, which is actually not so hard to prove, but that's really key. So what you can do is you can take the rather negative derivative of this, and that's the same in the case if uh, you have a regular measure, that's just the derivative of the logarithm. Okay, and uh, that's then supposed to be in L1. So, for this generalization, you can't define the logarithm of P, or P bar, this should be, yeah, uh, because you don't have the function P bar, but you still can take the derivative of it, and that's still well defined. And if you remember the, these invariant tensors, they were all defined just in terms of the derivatives of the logarithm. So that's, that just works uh, perfectly. Yeah. Um, so this makes sense, even though this does not. Uh, now, the, the other question is, how do you interpret k integrability? Uh, if that was a, remember, that was a condition that this is lies in LK. That now does not seem to be so natural, but um, as to that, I don't have colors. Okay, th so here I have a calculation for these invariant tensors, and there are some steps which are well defined, some which are not, and those I try to put in red. <laughs> but it doesn't come out. So you have to guess which ones are probably, okay. So here, well, uh, so, so here, suppose we have a density function, yeah? Then we have uh, this here, okay, that's the same as that. So you get basically power to uh, p to the n minus one down here. I distribute this p down to that, that's still legal. 
Okay, and that here is actually 1 over n, ti uh, n times the derivative of this guy. Okay, I take n factors n, I, I put this in front. I get this, that's still legal. Now I'm doing something highly illegal. Namely, I say, well, this measure, I want to take the uh, nth root of it and put it under this. Yeah? So I distributed that. Well, that's just the measure pi of psi. So I have to measure uh, pi of psi to the 1 over n. So I have a nth root of a measure, and I multiply nth root of a measure, and uh, I uh, get a measure. Yeah? Some nth root of something, the power to the end, but that's a measure. And then I integrate. Okay, now you may ask, that, does that make sense? I mean, can I make this rigorous that I actually uh, can talk about uh, nth root of measures? And the answer is, yes, we can. Uh, so what you do is, for any number between 0 and 1, you can define the Banach space, uh, so S of omega, that was just a space of signed measures. But we can define a Banach space whose element can be interpreted as the R's power of a measure. So R something, so it's a root, yeah, it's a R's between 0 and 1. And you have subsets of this form, and you can do anything you think you should be able to do. For example, you can multiply such measure. Uh, so, sorry, that's a cross here. Uh, so, uh, S, so we have a, a bilinear multiplication from SR cross SS into SR plus S. So uh, R's power times an S power is an R plus S power of a measure. Um, and you can raise this by a power for all R, as long as KR uh, are in this interval where this is defined. And this map is continuous for any k, so even if you take, let's say, a root or something, and it's differentiable if k is at least 1. Okay, so just, uh, so it's a very suggestive definition, but you can make this very precise. And now we can say that the general parameterized measure model is, in, is k integrable if, if I take the k's power of it, so that goes now to this, is weakly differentiable. What weakly means, I'm not going to explain. Um, and then this equation, actually, that we had before, yeah, I had this reformulation with, uh, with this uh, Proudhon um, uh, things, that can actually now, uh, makes perfect sense, because on the space S1 over N, you have a very natural tensor, which is just given by, take N of these vectors, multiply them together, now this is because we have this multiplication, this is now a measure, and you, and you do this. So, so the, these uh, the, uh, tensors here are just the pullback, of a measure uh, of a tensor which is defined only in terms of omega, and that's, I think that's a very nice uh, interpretation of this because this is this is now uh, defined invariantly of the model. Yeah, it's just uh, something that comes from uh, from omega. Okay, and now we sh uh, you can show that everything that I mean, you always have to test if you extend the definition. Uh, does, does anything? Uh, does something break down? Yeah, and. Uh, Okay, so the, the result on the, uh, on the invariant tensors, that goes through for that kind of model. Um, you can show that if, uh, if you have a, st a model which is k integrable and you push it forward by any statistic, but without any assumption on the statistic, actually, uh, it's, it remains to be k integrable. Um, and, uh, well, if, if we do not assume that k admits transverse measures, so we also uh, uh, include some very exotic uh, kinds of statistics. Uh, and then you have the monotonicity formula, and that's actually something which I want to point out. So here you have the mon monotonicity theorem, which tells you this. Uh, you have statistics, and then uh, you have this interpretation. If you have uh, the Fisher metric of the guy upstairs and the one downstairs, this is greater than or equal to zero for any tensor. And that's, uh, of course, interpret uh, interpreted as the information loss of the model under this cap. Yeah, so that measures how much information you lose. And it works in that generality. However, there's one big difference, and here uh, is actually where there might be uh, something which makes it even more interesting to consider this more general definition. Uh, well, if, if you look at the classical statement of the monotonicity, it says that uh, if this here is equal to zero for all, uh, for all B, then actually the statistic is sufficient. And this is no longer true. Yeah? Um, it's true if, uh, if, the, uh, if, if this is given by a regular density function, yeah, so then the, this here is uh, a sufficient model, even only if this is zero. But this is not true, and, and here's an example. Um, so, that, that's, so you take a rectangle, and then, and then you take the statistic is just a projection of the first component. And then you take something which is given by, the, by p bar, which is however not positive. Yeah? At psi equals zero, so you consider this for all psi and r, at psi equals zero, you have actually a, a big measure where this is equal to zero. 
Yeah? And uh, then you, you yeah, just compute. Yeah? You have the Fisher metric of this is equal to the Fisher metric of Xi, uh, Xi prime. And so there is no information loss, but K is not a, su a sufficient statistic for the model. Yeah? So if you only look out the positive ones, then it's regular there. So you have some measure for the positive ones, which is this one. You have a, a, a measure for which is statistic for the, for the other one, but uh, you have no measure such as a sufficient statistic for, for the whole thing. Yeah? And that just uh, was so simple because you regard a one-dimensional matter space. If you have another one, uh, then you... So, so what it means is you get a lot more uh, statistics which do not produce any information loss. Not just uh, sufficient statistics, but also others if you uh, change your sets where your measures are zero. And that... Uh, okay, that's it. Ah, so, so um, yeah, here's some, some references. Actually, uh, uh, this basic notion was, was uh, well, okay, so, so maybe some, sometime this book, it, it's in the review process for five years now, or so, know, it's, it only feels like this, but uh, hopefully this is will done with this. Okay, thank you. Yes, so we have time for one or two short questions. Uh, sorry, just a little comment. Uh, so, if you can see the space of uh, signed measures, uh, usually this is not an algebra under standard multiplication. So it's al it's an algebra. It's an, it's algebra, but it's not. So how you want to define square roots? You assume there is a multiplication. So there, uh, but it's not an algebra under standard multiplication. So it's a, it's a, it's algebra under convolution, for example, like L1, no, but no, it's no, not. That's not what you're doing. Here. We're doing something uh, more more simple. Uh, well, if, if you look at, at, at the space, um, well, okay, if, if you fix the background measure, then the measures which are dominated by that are just L1. Yeah? And how do you get from L1 to L, Lk? You take k groups. Maybe with, with a sign, uh, multiplied by the sign function, so that's a, uh, that's a bijection. Okay? And then you actually take a directed limit on the, on the set of sign measures under, the, under some uh, uh, order. That's actually the ultimate construction. So in the end, you, you end up with, I mean, the, the construction of this space is, and you don't use involutions, yeah, because you don't have any structure on omega. So, so, so there is one, one more short question yeah. there. Then you have to define yeah. okay. How, how okay. do you define the sigma algebra on omega? Pardon? How do you define sigma algebra on omega? Uh, that, that's good. So, so we start, and so, so, we, so the only thing that we assume is that we have some omega with some sigma algebra. But it does have, doesn't have to be Borel algebra, it doesn't have to be anything. It's just any, some measure space, measure space for me means just some set with some sigma algebra. Right, so what is the, the definition of measure? A measure is something that assigns to every, uh, every uh, element of the sigma algebra, some number. Such that. Uh, such that, uh, okay, for finite measures, it's, it's less than, uh, it's less than infinite, so it's a finite number. And it satisfies this, uh, well, this rule and it, it disjoint unions, so uh, infinite. <laughs> well, I mean. Uh, <laughs> okay, I think, I think we'll stop, stop there. That's a very interesting discussion, but unfortunately, we have little time and we, we want to have some time for the last speaker, and I propose to postpone this discussion for the, the coffee break. So, thank you very much, and let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.